40 years ago, the King's Church Mid-Sussex began meeting together as a church for the first time. But the story goes back even further than that to a house in the little village of Skeynes Hill. Nigel and Janita Ring had begun to gather a small group of people hungry for the presence of God and invited a young leader called Terry Virgo to teach them. We took Terry and Nigel back to Bracken Cottage to tell us how it all began. So Terry, I wonder how long it is since you came down this drive. I would think it must be 40 years when I first started coming here and uh, when I stopped coming here, really. You came and spoke into a group. We were already meeting here. Well, I remember teaching about the Holy Spirit, oh, yes. about the church being a many-membered body where we all had a part to play, and then the whole subject of the grace of God, which of course affected our worship. When the worship happened, we could, we could worship, we could come near to God. Of course, in those days, uh, there wasn't the extension on the house here. We had just finished putting these bay windows in and re renovating the house a little bit. Because we only had 12 or 15 people, that was big enough. Once you started coming, it grew 20, 30, 40, and we had to put the extension on, not with the second floor that's there now, but we had to put the extension on. And I remember we put in oh, probably 12 power sockets because everyone brought their tape recorders. And you were rather like holding a press conference with all the microphones in front of you. There was so little good material around in those days. Yeah, I remember yes. uh, in the end preaching in the door frame because people were in the room, out of the room, up the stairs, literally. Oh, that's right, even in the kitchen with the doors open. Yes, yeah. it was fun seeing there people piling in. There was such a in. hunger in those days, wasn't yes. there? Mm. And of course for us, meeting you and having that influence, I, I used to say to people, it was rather like turning from black and white to colour because suddenly there was a fresh vision of what the church was in all its New Testament colour. In 1977, the small group moved from Nigel and Janita's house into the bar lounge of Clare Hall in Haywards Heath. This was the moment that the house group became a church for the first time. We took Nigel and Terry back to Clare Hall to chat with David and Margaret Coke, the first leaders of the church, about what happened. Well, what happened here? How did we get to here? I, I remember church planting took me by surprise. It took us by surprise too. We were. Baptist and free church and uh, you just didn't do that kind of thing. We began to feel that God was saying, I want you to start a church. So we kind of got over the shock of that one a bit, felt it was right. And we kept praying and, uh, and one prayer time of a Saturday morning, Ken Douglas had a picture of the area, of the Mid-Sussex area, and uh, of a stone dropped into a pond or a lake with ripples going out from it. And he saw each town that we represented in the Mid-Sussex area having a ripple going out from it. And the only one where the ripples didn't die down, which they would naturally do, was Haywards Heath. And we concluded from that that we should meet in Haywards Heath. We inquired about this one and they said, no, I'm afraid you can't have it. It was a very new premises. Um, so we carried on, got ready to start somewhere, wondering where it was going to be. And for some reason, we said, let's try Clare Hall again, see if they'll do it. And that time they said, yes, you can. And so we said, oh, well, well, this room is about the right size. Or, albeit we said, but there's a bar in it. <laughs> but they said, it's OK, the grill will be down. <laughs> there was a certain structure of what we reckoned we would do in the morning, but uh, it could change and did change yes, often. Yes. Uh, and just the fact of, of a number of people taking part and nobody at that stage a properly trained leader. And we didn't know what <laughs> we were doing, did we? No, no, but we did know someone who knew about what they were doing and they did it extraordinarily well. Who could have thought that that prophecy that you talked about mm. from Ken of those ripples going out would have resulted in what we now know with mm. many churches around the world. I think it's probably 1,500 or so churches in maybe 70 or 80 nations. Wow, who mm. could have yeah. possibly envisaged yeah. it? We wanted to relive what those early meetings were like, so we gathered some of the people who are still part of TKC, who had been there in the early days to share their stories. When we started meeting in the bar lounge, I think it was sort of two circles of chairs. Mm. Um, we'd always sit on the back of a rose, I think, you know, yeah. keep out the way. <laughs> um, and I think probably worship time was normally just one person with a guitar mm. initially. Um, I think probably the men in particular were trained in the tambourine playing 
by Terry, our great leader, who always carried his tambourine with him and was very enthusiastic in playing it. It's died out now, I don't know why. <laughs> it, it wasn't the old hymn sandwich of the one hour type service. One of the problems was that this meeting would go on indefinitely. <laughs> you know, it, it could go on for as much as two hours. And to cater for that, we had a coffee break in between. I think that worship was being transformed uh, and it started in the informality of our homes where mm. uh, it was not easy to have hymn books or anything. We had bits of paper very often with choruses of hymns and so they would be sung very spontaneously, very often without an instrument. And worship began to be absolutely transformed yeah. from yeah. what we'd known before in our church life, where you might have like four hymns already pre-selected, to a very spontaneous mm -hmm. singing out of the choruses of hymns that we knew. I was really excited because we had recently read the book called The Lost Jewel of Worship. Oh. And we were thinking, yeah, wh what is this lost jewel of worship? We, we enjoy worshipping with the hymns. Mm -hmm. um, why do we need anything else? But then when we got involved with the singing at, at Clare Hall and, and the groups, we thought, this is the lost jewel of worship. Yeah, oh, lovely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sense of atmosphere, which was so wonderful when we were first meeting, and... Uh, as say this dramatic conversion then you you can believe for almost anything happening if it's happened to me anything can happen mm -hmm. and God became so big and then Mars um, had suffered with um, slip disc in her yeah. neck I found her going unconscious one day and we, we asked Terry to pray he said no more than thank you Jesus thank you Jesus was the prayer and suddenly Marcy's body shook and the disc went back into place and she never had that no. problem again. No. And the That's warmth good. and the yeah. sense of yeah. God's yeah. presence was just beautiful. Yeah. So those days were yeah. formation. Uh, we went to, to Plumpton for the Bible week and I, I was just thinking when we were singing about um, uh, uh, being world changers, it was the last yeah. downs and funny, yeah. if you walk along the top of the downs, if you go to Ditchling beacon and walk along mm. and uh, you look down on Plumpton and you think how hilarious was this <laughs> that here in that tiny little field we are singing we're going to change the world <laughs> and, uh, I was sort of thinking about that in a rather self-mocking way and think oh, who did we think we were and then you stand back and think yeah. hey yeah. now we're in like 70 or 80 nations we're in every continent of the world mm -hmm. and we're talking about 1500 churches and more being planted all the time. Yeah. So hey, maybe it wasn't so unrealistic, going from tiny beginnings into something that's still growing, yeah. praise yeah. the Lord. Yeah.